from everybody. I'm really, really pleased, and it's my, not only my pleasure, my honor to introduce you to the last, uh, uh, to the last invited speaker, speaker of this uh, last uh, session, which will be very dense in any in, in way, because we are supposed to uh, listen to the conclusions and replies uh, um, um, by uh, our keynote speaker, and uh, we we have uh, we, we we are on a little bit uh, out of time, but doesn't matter. Uh, we, we 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 try to, to manage anyway, and so um, without further hesitation, um, um, a, a John Horton uh, of uh, Key University. Uh, a, in fact, emeritus of political philosophy uh, at Key University, will uh, speak on associative political obligations and the distributive objection. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much, Roberta. Um, I want to begin with some, some general thanks, um, obviously to uh, the two Robertas, who I think are primarily responsible for inviting me. Um, but also to them, to the many Francescas, to, uh, to Sylvia, uh, to Sarah, who charmed their folk at the restaurant yesterday into doing a meal entirely for me. So thank you for that. Um, for our cameraman, for our athletic uh, people with the microphone who seem to be super fit, um, and indeed everyone else who has made this such a, a, a pleasant, friendly, as well as educative occasion. These things are very important as a visitor that you feel um, you know, at home. So thank you all very much for that. Um, uh, rather like Seamus yesterday, I'm also pleased to see that there's still an audience here, although I suspect that may have more to Margaret than to me, but I'll take it as a compliment even if it isn't. Uh, so thank you all very much. Um, I'm afraid I have no PowerPoint. Uh, I've never used PowerPoint in my life, and I'm not going to start now. If I could use it as Jacob used it, then I'm sure I could have many hours of fun in my retirement now. But I, I, I know I shall never reach uh, that level. Uh, more unforgivably, I don't have a, a handout, and I should have made a handout, and I apologise for that. Um, so mine is, in a sense, not so much, well, it's not technicolour, it's not even black and white, it's invisible. Um, in uh, partial uh, mitigation, um, even if I say so myself, there is a good summary uh, in the abstract of the paper. You know that does give you a very clear idea of what I'm going to do in the paper, because it doesn't have the content of the arguments. And also, uh, should anyone be available, uh, interested, sorry, uh, in uh, reading the paper as a whole, it does exist as a complete, proper paper. So I perfectly willing to, uh, to send it to anyone who emails me if they would like to read it. Um, I was also intending to sort of uh, read an edited version of it, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm actually just going to present it more sort of informally. I'm worried that I'll entirely send it to sleep if I read it. Um, as will have been abundantly clear from the conference so far, I am not a social ontologist. Um, I'm a political philosopher. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not as you know, don't kind of have an amateur interest in social ontology. I, I, I do, um, but uh, that's not really my area of, uh, of specialism. Uh, but I have learned a lot about uh, social ontology. Uh, moreover, my own work would uh, probably benefit uh, from um, the input of, uh, of, of, from social ontology. And in fact, that's how I first came across Margaret. Uh, work, uh, because it seemed uh, the kind of work that might provide a kind of ontological underpinning to the kinds of things that I wanted to say about political obligation. Of course, I, I guess not many people buy the whole of Margaret's picture, other than Margaret, and nor do I, um, but there was a lot in it that I found kind of extremely con con congenial and uh, helpful. And then, of course, Margaret produced her own book, on uh, political obligation, uh, which in, in, in my opinion, and I've been working on political obligation for a long time, is probably the most um, philosophically sophisticated uh, 
and the most philosophically deep were on political uh, obligation that's certainly been produced in my lifetime and probably for a lot longer. And I also think it's one of the two most important books on political obligation that have been produced in the last, I don't know, forever really, for, for a very long time anyway. And no, the other most important book is not my own book on political <laughs> obligation. It's by uh, A.J. Simmons called Moral Principles and Political Obligations, which, um, uh, although I regard as importantly mistaken in its conclusions, is undeniably a very important uh, work. Um, unfortunately, I think Margaret's work on political obligation, as opposed to her work in social ontology, has not received uh, the, the attention that it deserves. I think it has received attention, but I think it's a much more important work than you would gather from reading the political obligation literature. And I think that's, uh, I, I have a kind of um, explanation as to why that is. It's that social ontologists, for the most part, who have the philosophical tools to kind of deal with uh, it, are not really interested in political obligation, although I hope some of you are going to prove me wrong by being interested in political obligation today. Um, but um, political theorists, political philosophers of political obligation mostly don't have the philosophical tools to kind of deal with the sort of arguments that one represents. So when you mention it to political theorists, they, they, they mostly sort of say, well, it is very difficult to sort of think. And so they don't really engage with it. Well, uh, that, that's the sort of build-up, and now I'm going to slightly disappoint you because I'm going to tell you that I'm not actually going to engage directly with uh, 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 Margaret's work. I have written about Margaret's uh, work, both in the second edition of my book uh, and in a symposium, and I was uh, uh, fortunate enough uh, to be a reader for the publishers of uh, uh, a draft of the, of the book. Um, but I'm not going to address it here. Uh, I hope it is clear that this is not a mark of disrespect uh, to uh, Margaret. And I hope that she will find uh, some of the things I have to say uh, at least simpatico to her position. That's about the extent of my Italian. Um, uh, I should have made uh, 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 clear, much clearer on the programme that this is a jointly authored paper, in fact. It's, it's um, jointly authored with my last uh, uh, completed graduate student before I retired, Ryan Windeconnect, who's an American and is currently based in the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, so we are uh, a plural subject based on a joint commitment in that issue. Uh, uh, it's usual on these occasions when things are jointly authored to say, well, if there's anything any good in the paper, that's mine. If there's anything that's uh, wrong with the paper, that's Ryan. Uh, I can't honestly say that because um, uh, Ryan actually hasn't had a chance even to read the version of the paper that I'm working from here, so I will have to take uh, uh, the blame for what's wrong. I hope he's actually working on it at this very moment, improving it. So, um, some very quick background because you're, probably most of you are not familiar Um, I've been trying to uh, articulate and make plausible uh, what's now called an associative theory of political obligation for more than about 35 years, something like that. Um, of course, my view of what it involves has, you'll be relieved to hear, changed uh, during that time, uh, in some respects quite substantially. Um, and when I first started out with the view, it didn't have this kind of label. It was kind of called a communitarian view or an identity view or something like this. But it's, it's always been essentially the same, the, the same core idea. Um, and it's principally uh, presented in um, uh, a book that I wrote on political obligation, the first edition of which came out in 1991, and then the second edition of which came out in 2010. And uh, the second edition is substantially different from uh, the first edition. It isn't just a reprint of the first edition with an introduction, which is the way people academics recycle their volumes to get extra sales. Um, I can't pretend that uh, very many people have been persuaded by, by my view of associativism. So, 
was not a huge uh, at school of it. And I, uh, I'm never entirely clear whether Margaret fully belongs in this camp or, or not, because it's a more kind of, I think, kind of uh, voluntaristic element in Margaret's account uh, than there is in mine. Uh, my own asceticism has largely been uh, developed against the background uh, of a view known as philosophical anarchism. Uh, on this view, we don't have any political obligations. And this is because in order to have political obligations, they would have to be based on some genuine act of voluntary consent or agreement to them. Uh, and we would have to actually make uh, a voluntary agreement. So uh, voluntariness is a, is a condition, and then actually making the voluntary act is the second condition. Uh, now, we agree with the second claim that um, if it was based on, uh, needed to be based on voluntary action, then we would have to make a voluntary commitment, uh, and no such voluntary commitment has been made by most people. Um, uh, but we don't agree with the first of these premises. We don't think that political obligation has to be uh, 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 based on a, a voluntary uh, commitment in any uh, strong or very meaningful sense. Having said that, in this paper I deal with a completely different kind of uh, objection to an associative uh, theory of political obligation. And uh, this is one which has emerged particularly from the literature on uh, global justice, cosmopolitanism, this kind of literature which is now huge and vast and immensely uh, uh, productive uh, area. Um, uh, and the, the uh, form of uh, this objection is the objection to the title, uh, the distributive objection, and that's what I'm going to try uh, to address in this paper. Uh, the paper falls into five parts. Uh, in the first part, I just say something very general about the nature of associativism for obvious reasons. Um, that's just kind of contextual, and I can't give a kind of full account of, uh, of uh, an associative theory of political obligation. Um, the second part uh, <coughs> explains the nature of the distrib distributive objection. What, what is it that they're, they're arguing against an associative view? Um, and then sections three through five um, give uh, our response to the associative objection. Um, and these, these three lines of response, or three strategies, as we sometimes call them, uh, we label the strategy of avoidance, the strategy of mitigation, and the strategy of confrontation. And I'll just explain what those are when we come along. Um, so in the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to go uh, quickly through uh, these five sections. So, associative political obligations. Associative political obligations are part of a larger class of associative obligations or duties um, or responsibilities. We don't make any systematic distinction uh, between these terms. They're just some kind of moral consideration or moral reason or uh, substantial strength. Um, uh, they are um, moral uh, uh, obligations or duties that arise by virtue of a particular form of association or relationship, such as the family, such as friendship, or the polity. Uh, so they are obligations we have as friends, uh, as uh, uh, parents, as siblings, as colleagues, as fellow citizens. The background thought, really, to um, associative, associativism, uh, the intuitive idea behind it, is perhaps well expressed by Sam uh, Scheffler uh, when he writes, and I'll just quote here, Ordinary moral opinion continues to see associative duties as central components of moral experience. In doing so, it recognizes some claims upon us whose source lies neither in our own choices nor in the needs of others, but rather in the complex and constantly evolving constellation of social and historical relations into which we enter the moment we are born. 
For we are, after all, born to parents we did not choose at a time we did not choose. And we land in some region we did not choose, of a social world we did not choose. And from the moment of our birth, and sometimes sooner, claims are made on us and for us and to us. And if, in due course, we inject our own wills into this mix, straining against some ties and enhancing others, sometimes severing old bonds and acquiring new ones, the verdict of common moral opinion seems to be that we can never wipe the slate entirely clean. Our specific historical and social identities, as they develop and evolve over time, continue to call forth claims with which we must reckon, claims that cannot, without distortion, be construed as contractual in character, and which are not reduced to silence by general considerations of need. So that I find quite an eloquent expression of the, of the underlying thought. So associative obligations grow out of patterns of social relationship in which we find ourselves, even though we cannot be said fully, or in some cases at all, to have chosen them. Associative political obligations are those we owe to fellow members of our polity or political community. These are marked by common political authority, shared political institutions, the structure of law, and these kinds of things. In our view, associative obligations generally are an independent source, as, you know, as um, Sheffield was uh, hinting at, an independent source of moral obligations in the sense that they are irreducible to universal duties or to voluntary commitments. Universal duties such as not to kill and stuff like that, or voluntary commitments such as promises. They are, in fact, a third uh, uh, source of uh, uh, moral uh, uh, value and obligation. And as I said at the beginning, this paper can't actually be a defense of that claim. I'm just telling you in a sense where, where we're coming from. Okay, so that's really all that time, I think, to say about uh, associative obligations generally. So what is the distributive objection? It's basically a charge of unfairness or injustice that it thinks associative obligations uh, give rise to. Roughly, the objection says that it is wrong to give priority to members of one's own political community over everyone else if others will be more adversely affected, especially when it comes to the distribution of valuable, valuable resources. Again, Scheffler provides you know, a, a canonical statement of the distributive objection. Uh, this is a brief outline. The distributive objection challenges the idea that members of affluent societies have special responsibilities to their associates that they do not have to other people. The objection need not deny that there are important differences of character and motivation between those who take such responsibilities seriously and those who act out of crudely self-interested motives. Nevertheless, it insists that special responsibilities serve to validate a natural tendency to partiality or favoritism within groups. And the effect of this form of validation is to confer unfair advantages on members of wealthy groups while placing other people at an unfair disadvantage. The distributive objection comes in stronger or weaker forms. And, um, we can't, in the context of this paper, dis distinguish uh, all these different forms of the objection. We're obviously mostly concerned with the strongest uh, forms of these objections because they're the ones that raise the, the biggest challenge to uh, the associative uh, account. Um, in weaker forms, um, there may be uh, a place uh, for, for political obligations, sometimes even a reasonably substantial uh, place, although um, they're usually perceived from a, a global or cosmopolitan perspective as being subservient ultimately to uh, universal uh, uh, distributive duties. At its strongest, though, the distribution, the distributive objection uh, associated with strong forms of global egalitarianism, for example, um, often disparage the whole idea of specific obligations to one political community as uh, morally arbitrary and as uh, irrational. So we are concerned um, especially to resist the stronger forms of this objection 
But we are actually concerned also to resist any account that makes uh, association obligations necessarily always subservient to um, uh, broader distributive uh, questions. However, we're not concerned to deny that there, there are what might be called general humanitarian duties and that these sometimes rightly take priority over other moral claims. So we're not people who, uh, we're not in that category who are more, who argue that we just don't have universal moral duties or anything like that. The important motivation of our position is to show uh, that there can be uh, uh, room uh, for both, even though sometimes they conflict and sometimes sharply. Okay, so um, uh, let's move on to the uh, to, to the argument. Uh, in response to the to the objection uh, to associative uh, political obligations that the distributive objection presents, um, we adopt three argumentative strategies. The first two of which, that of um, uh, avoidance and of uh, mitigation are essentially conciliatory. They're in a sense not looking to pick a fight, they're trying to avoid a fight with uh, global uh, uh, justice theories. They're, they're essentially saying, okay, yes, yeah, we, can, we, can, we can all live together reasonably happily. Okay? Uh, the third uh, approach, as its name rather suggests, confrontation is exactly that. It's a more confrontational, a more oppositional response, certainly to strong of a global egalitarianism. But the first uh, strategy, the strategy of avoidance, um, this draws attention to the fact, uh, okay, the fact that there may often be no conflict between our political obligations and duties of global justice. And this can be for a number of reasons. Firstly, their content simply may not overlap in any way. They may be entirely discrete. Um, they may have different uh, objects. Um, so, um, a duty to obey uh, the traffic laws or public health regulations of our society and so on do not really present any problems uh, uh, for uh, uh, global uh, uh, justice. So, that's one kind of reason why uh, we can avoid a conflict. Another possibility is that sometimes, at least, uh, the conflict their content may be mutually supportive when they do overlap. Um, so, I mean, if a, a state, for example, is actively pursuing a policy of uh, global justice, then uh, unfortunately not many states do pursue that. But if they did, um, then it would be uh, 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 possible for our political obligations and our, and our duties of global justice to be mutually support each support each other. Uh, and the third reason is that um, uh, a lot of our um, uh, duties in both, of both sorts can be, in a way, quite open-ended and indeterminate in how they're interpreted. So there may be kind of flexibility for uh, interpreting in, in ways which um, avoid a conflict uh, between them. Uh, of course, the, the, this is not always going to be uh, uh, possible. Um, And finally, um, political obligations, like, like most obligations of duties, have their own inherent limits. So, uh, you know, nobody who believes in associative obligations believes that you could do anything in promotion of uh, 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 the ends of your political community or the good of your political community, just as you can do anything to promote the interests of your family or your friends or like that. The uh, associative obligations exist in a not in a moral vacuum, but in a, a larger moral context in which other moral considerations do place constraints on them in, in various ways. Um, now, it's not claimed that the strategy of avoidance always eliminates conflict between the sensitive political obligations and duties of global justice, only that it can and does sometimes, uh, and uh, sometimes in significant and non trivial ways. And then there's a strategy of uh, mitigation. 
Uh, the strategy of mitigation allows that there are conflicts between associated political obligations and duties of global uh, redistribution, but holds that there may be ways to significantly soften the impact of such conflicts, that is, mitigate the effects of such conflicts. So they're still there, but they're, they're perhaps not so serious, they're not so bothersome. Um, and this is uh, possible, for example, where uh, one of them, obviously and uncontroversially, is more weighty than the other. Just because they're two independent sources of information doesn't mean that in some instances uh, one will not be obviously uh, more important or more weighty than another. Some political obligations will be quite trivial, uh, which set against um, uh, very demanding uh, uh, duties of global justice will clearly be subservient to them. That doesn't mean, uh, or, or, or subsidiary to them, that doesn't mean we, we don't have those uh, uh, political obligations. It just means that when they conflict, we clearly have to give uh, priority to the more uh, uh, weighty one, to the less weighty one. Um, and the second way in which we may mitigate conflicts is where um, some sort of uh, compromise is possible before them. Um, it may be that neither duty can be fulfilled in full, um, but a large measure of both uh, can be uh, uh, met. Uh, so some kind of compromise or mutual, mutual adjustment uh, may mean that what is most important in both, at least, uh, 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 can be met. Uh, again, we don't uh, claim that this is um, going to deal with all uh, uh, such conflicts. But uh, taken together, we do think that the strategies of avoidance and mitigation uh, can take uh, a good deal of the heat out of the supposed irreconcilability of acknowledging one's associative political obligations and one's humanita humanitarian duties of global justice. So we think we can go quite a long way in saying we don't have to um, be enemies over this. But still and all, um, uh, both these strategies will not always uh, be sufficient uh, and there may well be um, significant conflicts uh, between our political obligations and our uh, duties of uh, uh, global justice. Uh, and here we introduce our strategy of uh, confrontation uh, and this is directed at, uh, in particular, at strong forms of global egalitarianism, those which are especially inclined to deny any uh, moral significance uh, uh, to the membership of the political community, seeing it as essentially morally arbitrary. Um, one of our uh, main contentions here is precisely to deny uh, that uh, membership of the political community is morally arbitrary or irrelevant. Um, in this section of the paper, quite a lot of the argument is conducted specifically in relation to um, some arguments by Simon Caney, who's developed this argument quite forcefully. Um, I think it isn't really quite possible to present those sort of here and now in the detail because it, it involves quite a lot of quotation from Haney in order to present his new family and then reactions to those. But if anyone is interested in uh, that, then of course, uh, as I said earlier, I'm happy to send a uh, paper. But the general kind of gist of these uh, responses and the general line of these responses is that we think that. Uh, a membership of a political community is a morally significant feature of our lives. And in various ways, it gives meaning and shape to our lives and our sense of who we are. Membership is not about morally, uh, is not about arbitrary lines drawn on a map, even if those lines often are, in some respect, uh, arbitrary. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're arbitrary in their consequence. They're arbitrary in the sense that they're contingent and so on. There was nothing necessary about the world of states that we have now. It was always the case. And maybe at some distant point in the future, it will no longer be uh, the case. But in the world we, we have at the moment, the world in which we live, 
the context uh, of our moral thinking and our moral life, these are an important dimension uh, of our life. Uh, maybe at some point in the future, families won't matter or whatever, you know. So, you know, so of course it, 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 it's kind of uh, it's historicized in the kitchen, but you know, this is the world we live in, and these uh, these things have significance for us. So, um, I just read one brief uh, paragraph uh, from the paper here, uh, which is uh, in a bit more purple prose. Um, it's sort of articulating this point. I should be in well within under the 10 minutes. Um, we believe that equality is not just an arbitrary arrangement of borders, although the borders of states are often to some degree arbitrary. There is a common life in the sense that citizens share a set of institutions and laws, often a broader culture, history, and set of values, all of which um, can have genuine worth to them and play an important role in structuring their lives. The polity, at least when functioning reasonably effectively, of course there can be failed polities, bad polities, uh, can be a strong source of stability and security and for many of its members it provides a rich source of identity. Moreover, to be a member of a polity is to share not only in the benefits of membership, but also the corresponding burdens, which in extreme circumstances may include the expectation that citizens be willing to risk their lives in defence of their country. The specificities of such features are what distinguish individuals who are members of a particular polity from those who are not. It seems, therefore, to pretend that a polity is no more than an arbitrary arrangement of lives on the map is a false and misleading form of reductivism. Membership of a state typically matters, admittedly to different degrees and different ways, but it matters to those who are members, and they are neither rogues nor fools for thinking that it does, and for attaching significance and moral importance to it. So, as I said, much of this, the argument in this section uh, relates specifically uh, to Keynes, and if people want to ask more about um, this argument, which I presented in a, in a very brief and schematic form, I'm aware that I'm happy to try and elaborate it uh, further uh, in the discussion. Um, but I'll move instead to the conclusion. So, what I've, uh, what we've argued. Sorry about the schizophrenic move between us. It's partly because the use of we, if you come from England, uh, has kind of associations with the royal we, so it sounds rather pompous. But I only use it because we are a plural subject, so it seems appropriate to use it. But as Ryan's not here, you know, I feel ambiguous about speaking for him, so I hope it's his So often then, the conclusion is, uh, there need be no serious conflicts between our political obligations and our duties to relieve global suffering, especially when the latter are not interpreted in very demanding terms of uh, global egalitarianism. When the latter is interpreted in strongly egalitarians, uh, it's more likely that there will be uh, conflicts and serious conflicts. But even in the weaker forms, they, they can be. Our position is that neither sets of claims on us can uh, uh, demand a priori priority over the other. Uh, we have a kind of pluralist, uh, a morally pluralist view of the world in which a variety of sources of demands and uh, more demands and claims are made on us. And the best we can do is a kind of contextual reasoning issue in, in specific uh, uh, practical judgments particular time, there's no algorithm for this, there's no set of uh, priority rules, and a whole range of uh, factors, some of which are largely uncontroversial, others of which people are kind of judge differently, and in our view this is just the kind of nature of uh, moral reasoning, so we're quite kind of uh, minimalist about how actually prescriptive we can, we, we can be, um, but we do want to uh, assert um, that political obligations, um, in that, and for us that means associative uh, political obligations, are real and substantial moral claims that are, are made on us, and these are, in, uh, uh, in uh, Scheffler's words, not 
uh, reduced to silence by the demands of uh, global uh, justice. Thank you very much. presentation but also for having <laughs> spared the five minutes precious minutes discussion and having addressed some crucial very crucial issues to our contemporary world so uh, let's go and the first one is Helen is a huge one and the second one is Chris. It will be very brief as not usual and uh, I, I can't even I won't try to tell you my appreciation. Um, so uh, Okay, so it won't be silenced by demands of global egalitarianism. Um, so this is a, a bid to get more from you about the nature of these obligations and their relation, say, to universal claims of another sort. How then, well, can revolution then be justified? Of course, the reference to Rousseau is what I intend. How do you uh, justify revolution, if at all, in the light of political, associative and if that's not a good question, explain why. No, it's a, a, an entirely reasonable question because one of the um, very familiar responses to this line of argument is that it's uh, essentially conservative, uh, uh, sometimes with a small c, sometimes with a big c. Um, uh, we're quite anxious um, to, um, to kind of deny the attribution of conservatism uh, to our argument. In relation to what you say, we're not saying that kind of all states uh, necessarily um, uh, have these uh, qualities. We're talking about um, reasonably well-functioning states that do d deliver uh, goods uh, for their populations, particularly uh, the kind of goods of order and security, what Bernard Williams calls the kind of first problem of, uh, of uh, political uh, uh, philosophy. But clearly, for example, if uh, states are not delivering these kinds of things are maybe very good reasons to uh, try to get rid of the, of, uh, of, of the government or reconstitute the state or something like that. So, so then the obligations are derivative of something broader or more primary principle? Uh, yes, okay. yeah. I mean, that's, that's because I haven't, as I, I kind of explained at the beginning, I haven't been able to give the full associative account, you know. Uh, I know it sounds a bit pathetic and self-important, but you know, I've written a whole book in which, which kind of spells out um, what that is, and you know, uh, the specific goods of political association I take to be the goods of order and security. Uh, these are the essential goods of political association, just as uh, the family um, typically has certain um, essential goods to it, as that form of association, intimacy perhaps, and, and, and other things. So. So ultimately, you know, that is part of the picture of what gives sense to our political uh, obligations. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'd also like to offer a comment on the question of um, whether associative political obligations necessarily conflict with um, principles of global justice. I, I think one um, helpful distinction is that between relational and non-relational theories of global justice. So the non-relational theories of which various versions of lack egalitarianism are perhaps the most prominent um, are the ones that um, are perhaps hardest to reconcile with associative obligations. So the non-relational theories of global justice um, uh, simply assert that there are a number of egalitarian distributive obligations um, at the level of the world at large, quite independently of the relations that obtain within this world. So according to a non-relational theory of global justice, even if we had a world uh, that consists of um, completely separate and disconnected, mutually disconnected <coughs> island states that have nothing to do with each other and that never had any history of interaction. I mean, it's not like our current world. Even then, the non-relational global justice theorist would say there are various egalitarian distributive obligations 
uh, across all these different um, units, despite their, their detachment. While the relational global justice theorists would say um, the strong egalitarian distributive obligations come on stream only when there are certain relations in place between the different agents, countries, political units involved. And one can then, of course, debate on what exactly the nature of those relations is that, that brings those egalitarian duties on stream. I mean, one might say a history of prior interaction is, is enough to bring those obligations on stream, or maybe current trade relations, or what political relations, whatever it might uh, be. Now, according to such a relational theory, the extent of global egalitarian distributive duties will depend very much on facts about what the current um, structure of relations is in this, in this world. And to the extent that we are living in an extremely interconnected world, which well, has been interconnected for a long time mm. already, and recalling the histories of colonial legacy and, yes. and so on, but which continues to be very interconnected and maybe even increasingly so, then we might say that um, uh, this rich web of relationships is such that um, a theory according to which various obligations are triggered by relations is actually very natural in such a world. So in short, there's probably a good way to reconcile associative political obligations with relational theories of global justice, while this distributive objection arises primarily from the non-relational mm -hmm. And So I was just wondering whether you share that way of looking at things or whether you'd like to qualify. I do now. Um, <laughs> That was uh, characteristically uh, incisive and helpful uh, 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 suggestion, um, uh, Christian, because we, we, we undeniably had some difficulty in kind of cutting up this vast um, uh, global justice literature in, 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 a, in a way that makes it manageable. Uh, um, uh, but just to say something, I mean, even in the non-relational kind, there might be... Um, Kind of weak, um, you know, universal demands of justice, like you know, to relieve uh, extreme suffering and so on. And we'd be we'd, we'd be happy with that as well. You know, it is only the the strong egalitarian forms of uh, non-relation. Maybe just one quick justice. remark on this. So I think yes. that, that, so. There's definitely common ground, as far as I'm aware, between both the relational and non-relational yes. theorists that various duties of uh, humanitarian yeah. assistance uh, yes. apply across the board, yes. so no one, yes. no one ever denies yeah. this. Even if we have these completely disconnected islands, yes. if, a, if a natural yes. catastrophe happens yes. on one, the others obviously yes. ought to help. Yes. But I'm also anxious to make it clear that we are not denying that either. Um, no? Oh, you you raised the hand. Sorry. So, mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Hi, thank you, John. Um, I'm just wondering of a, of a sort of general perspective on this. Um, so, as well as uh, political association obligations, people talk about familial obligations. So, other people who say, um, maybe Margaret Thatcher said something, and she said there is no such thing as society, only families. And, um, but the general point is, would somebody say these familial obligations are bad because let's say you have an affluent family and uh, you, know, you owe your affluent family, I don't know, all the affluent things that, that they, uh, they want and then there's all these poor people in your very own society um, who are going to be neglected. And it seems that there's a parallel argument associational political obligations versus the world and the associational familial obligations versus your own society. Um, I just wonder if any of the people doing this in terms of global justice see that there's these possibilities or what you would say about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Um, it is there in the, in the global justice uh, literature in parts of it. 
months ago. Uh, and uh, part of it is about um, restricting the kind of claims that can be made, um, even by familial uh, considerations. But, you know, in a way, understandably, a lot of the global justice uh, theorists, uh, although they, they want to limit them, um, are, are much less inclined to want to dismiss uh, entirely the idea that there are familial uh, obligations. And of course, it's not inconsistent uh, to say that, well, uh, there are associative obligations in the case of close intimate groups like uh, the family, but not in the case of the, uh, of the state. Um, you know, as you know, I try to argue that I, that I think there are still good arguments for them in the case of the uh, political, um, political community. Um, and uh, again, often sort of rhetorical, not in the in a kind of strict sense, not uh, in an entirely negative sense. I often sort of invoke, uh, I didn't in the talk, but they do come up in the paper, uh, familial ones for people who are, you know, uh, very militantly opposed to the idea of associative obligations and sort of say, well, okay, you know, what, 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 what do you think about family ones? You really think that um, we don't have special obligations here. And of course, people's intuitions there are, tend to be much more much more robust, but they, well, we do have some sort of obligations there. Um, so, you know, I, 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 uh, strategy is often to kind of work out from those, if we have those, if we have them to family, if we have them to colleagues, you know, if we, if we have a whole, of, well, why can't we have them to, to, to the political? Thanks. Yeah, I uh, I find your picture quite uh, reasonable. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Stop that. <laughs> um, and what I, I guess I'm uh, just sort of it's associated duties as a sort of quite a wide ranging. Uh, so, so let's just think about political uh, in the, the narrow. The, the, as I would understand that um, the, the political duties. As opposed to the rest. I mean, so someone might, and I would certainly agree with you, someone said, well, you know, we've got this uh, apparatus, this institution of government, that's our, our government, and um, of course that government has been put in place specifically to look after our interests, and, and it would seem pretty reasonable to think that that's what they've got to do first, even though they've got to do other things later, uh, because that's the nature of the institutional arrangement that they've been. So I don't really see that as a problem. I mean, it'd be a bit like, look, you're an academic, um, so I don't expect you to, I expect you to discharge your obligations as an academic. Uh, I don't expect you to kind of be doing a lot of the discharging obligations of, of other people. Um, now, of course, you'd have an argument about the, the nature of the institutional arrangements to start off with, but leaving that aside. But, um, but as members of the political community, presumably, They've got obligations with respect to their own community political obligations, right? So if, if it's a really bad government, say in South Africa, as, as was the case, that I'm going to so well, you might say, in, and this would be consistent with what your mind would say, but, well, actually, the, the South Africans have got a stronger obligation to do something about their government than we have from somewhere else. Okay. So, so all that seems reasonable and consistent with. But what, what I guess I'm not quite so convinced by is that once we get beyond associative duties of a, an explicitly political kind, like be they the duties or obligations of the, the members of this polity, the political obligations, or the duties and obligations of the government per se, it's not clear to me that if we leave that aside, um, other more general obligations may just be the same. I mean, so, uh, insofar, of course, there are pragmatic considerations, instrumentalist considerations. So it's not clear to me that, for example, if it comes to uh, a range of basic human rights, that you owe anything more to your members of your community than you owe to someone else. Or at least, what, not clear what the argument for that is. Right, so in other words, I'm trying to sort of drive a bit of a wedge between mm. uh, different 
categories of associative form and suggest that in the narrow sense of political, those narrowly political uh, obligations of members of the polity and the government as opposed to other ones. So I'm just wondering how you respond to that. That's a very interesting question. Um, I haven't thought about it in quite that way. We should have done. Um, uh, first response, and I may have changed my mind if I find this sounds a bit stuff I don't want to be committed to. My first response is to say that, uh, so far as basic human rights are concerned, there is no uh, difference in that uh, in, in that sense. It's not part of the view that the basic human rights of your fellow citizens matter more than the basic uh, human rights of other people who are basic human rights. There might be all, well there are, all, as you, as you hinted at, all manner of kind of pragmatic uh, kind of considerations that mean you're much more likely to be able to um, protect them and institute them in your own uh, state than you are university. But you, you're not claiming, uh, and it's important uh, part of this, I mean, you're not claiming that, uh, well, we're not claiming, I think, but the people in your political community are intrinsically more important in some sense than people in other, uh, 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 outside of your political community. Well, specifically, that the obligations that you have to people in that respect are any different, other, you know, pragmatic considerations aside. Yeah. I think that's what I go with for now until someone tells me that's wrong. Yes. There is just a last question, maybe. So um, I just want to follow on that point, maybe, uh, with a sort of current example that maybe puts it a little pointedly, which is um, my wife, actually, and I have this argument sometimes when deciding where to um, put our money, our charitable contributions. And uh, she often launches this argument that uh, we should put them close to home. We owe more to fellow New Yorkers than we owe to people across the world, and we you know until homelessness is eradicated nearby, we shouldn't eradicate. Them. What you know that that sort of argument. Um, it occurs to me that a lot of this sort of you know practicality arguments don't apply here. I mean, the argument that I always make is it'll go a lot long, a lot farther elsewhere in the world than it'll go in New York City. You know more people's human rights. So is it just a counting game at that point in terms of the number of people's human rights that you can fulfill? I mean, presumably, somebody who holds associated political obligations might want to use them to prioritize um, fellow uh, you know, uh, citizens over distant strangers, right? Even with respect to human rights. So until human rights are completely secure among my fellow uh, citizens, I'm not going to move beyond the poverty. And is that your view? I mean, it seemed like maybe you were committing yourself to something like that with your last answer. So, I don't know, just to clarify. Um, I think that's permissible, but not required. So I think it's, you know, you can defend human rights wherever you can, sort of thing. So if you think you can do that in your community, or that's where you want to prioritize your effort, well, you know, you're defending human rights and your own citizens, you know. To that as well, but if you took a view, well, uh, no, I think um, that um, uh, I could do more, perhaps, to uh, help other people. Um, uh, you said perhaps it would be a question of money going further, or perhaps it was would be that the rights violations were more serious elsewhere, all these kinds of things. Um, and there might not be any again clear way of weighing these things up. More people as against seriousness of uh, uh, rights violations as against. You know, well, I think it's more likely to be effective if I do it locally and if I do it there. All these things can come in. So, you know, the important thing really is that you're doing something about human rights violations. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess that's the response that I want to make. Okay. Um, I think there would be more many questions. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that um, we, uh, we just have the time uh, to, to thank John once more um, very much for this uh, discussion.